So thanks for that introduction. And in light of that, one day a robot will perform surgery on you. Just let that sink in for a minute. How does that make you feel? How should it make you feel? In fact, there are people in this very room who have already had a robot perform surgery on them and don't even know it. It didn't look like this, though. The robot that performed surgery on you didn't look at all like this. So let me give you an example. So about a week ago, I went to my annual eye exam. This is me walking into the doctor's office. And I sat down in the doctor's office, and boom, right in front of me was not one, but three robots that looked like this. Now, you might be thinking, oh, these don't look like robots to me. Where's the, uh, the laser eyes or the Terminator-looking head? But I assure you, these are robots. Inside of each of them is a brain that thinks, uh, our sensors that can see the world around them, and our motors that can move parts of them around just like you or I move our hands and arms. So these really actually are robots. And so one of them actually you know, scanned my eye and picked out the exact perfect glasses prescription for me. Um, and oh, by the way, these glasses, when they got made, they got made by yet another robot. They ground them to the exact thickness and curvature for my eyes. So there are a lot of robots involved here. But let's take it one step further. Uh, so by show of hands, how many people here today have had LASIK eye surgery? So you, I see a number of hands in the audience. So there are 40 million people worldwide who have had LASIK surgery. And those of you who've had it, you had a robot operate on you. And it looked like this. So again, not what you picture as a robot, but inside there are motors aiming a laser beam at your eye to cut parts of it out so that your eye will be reshaped so you can see better. And so why is it that we want a robot involved in these kind of procedures? Well, take a look at this. This is a video of my wife's eye. And the first thing you notice is it moves around quite a bit. And people are wide awake when they're getting LASIK surgery. So there's no guarantee they're not going to look off to the side. And do you really want a doctor holding the laser beam as that eye moves around? I sure don't. I want a robot that can really fast and accurately track and compensate for that eye movement and get the cut in exactly the right place. So this is not just an eye surgery. This is a trend in all sorts of surgery. This is the number of robots in surgery that are in human use today. And you can see the dramatic upward rise in just the last couple of years. And if we drill down to just one of those robots, this is uh, the Da Vinci system from Intuitive Surgical. And you can see that the same sort of dramatic upward tick. And now it's used on 3 quarters of a million people per year. So this is why I say a robot will one day be used, if it hasn't already been, in your surgical procedure. And I want to take a step back and ask why that is. And so I'm going to show you a picture that's a little graphic. It's what surgery looks like today when a robot is not used. So if you're sensitive to that, just close your eyes for a second. Here's what surgery looks like. So when I look at this, and I've observed many surgical procedures in the operating room, the first thing I see is they've made a really big incision on the patient. And why is it so big? Because they have to get something this big inside the person. That's the only reason they cut, made that big of a cut on the patient. They got to get their hand in there. And then the other thing I notice is that they spend the vast majority of their time in surgery just looking for what they're trying to operate on. Where's the organ I want to work on? Where's the tumor inside that organ? That consumes a lot of their time. And robots can actually help with both of these jobs and make them a lot better. So here's the most popular robot on the market today. This is the Da Vinci system from Intuitive. In this system, the doctor is sitting over on the left-hand side of your screen at a console, remote controlling the robot that's on the right-hand side of your screen that's over the patient. And here's what it looks like. The doctor's hands are on the bottom, and then on the top are the robot hands. And you can see that the robot hands are directly following whatever the doctor does. So what's the advantage of this? Well, the robot hands are the size of a ballpoint pen instead of the size of my hand or arm. And so you can get those into the patient through much smaller incisions. So that's a big win for the patient. What are some of the drawbacks of the current generation of surgical robots? Well, they require a lot of space inside the patient because they have these rigid tool shafts that have to pivot at the body wall. So you need a lot of room to work in. 
So what does that do? Well, it limits them to areas of the body like the abdomen that can be inflated to create that space. Where can't they go today? Areas like the brain. You can't really blow up the person's head to create more space. Uh, places like the lungs. If you want to go down the throat, there's just not room for the tool to work. Or parts of the urologic system where the, the structures are so small that those robot hands even can't get in there. So my team at Vanderbilt and I are working on building the next generation of surgical robots that will be able to reach some of these challenging spaces. And where do we look for inspiration? I mean, how should we change that robot to make it better? Well, we look at the world around us, and we looked at something you might never have thought would be associated with surgery, uh, or even robots. It was this. So we watched elephants and how their trunks move. And it's fascinating, right? These things can bend and elongate in ways that your hand and arm could never do, and the current generation of surgical robots could never hope to do. And so we took that inspiration and we built something that's much smaller, it's the size of a needle, but it has that same ability to bend and elongate as it moves. And just to give you an idea of how small it is, this is our robot compared to the Da Vinci robot. And to really drive home how small it is, this is our robot compared to a penny. It has a slightly different tip on it, but you can see they're really, really small which is great for patients because they get into the body through very small openings. So where can we use these in surgery? Well, this is my friend Fabian Maldonado. He's a doctor at Vanderbilt, and he spends his days taking care of lung cancer patients. And he just gets so frustrated because the tools that he's using don't let him help many of the patients that he wishes he could help. And why is that? Well, the tool he uses mainly is called a bronchoscope, and that's what you see here. And that goes down the throat, and it can reach about one-third of the lung, the green area here on the slide. And, but if the patient has a problem that's in the outer edge of the lung, this area, the outer two-thirds, he just can't get there down the throat, which is the least invasive way to get there. And so a lot of patients he just has to send home and say, well, wait, and we'll see if your tumor grows. Well, all the while, their life expectancy is plummeting if their tumor does, in fact, grow. So he has this dilemma, and so he and I set out to build a better uh, system to help these patients. And this is what we came up with. It's a three-stage system, and it starts out with the bronchoscope, just the standard one that he already uses. And he puts that down the throat as far as he can go, and then out of it, he deploys this concentric tube robot that I told you about a minute ago. And then the third stage, which gets all the way to the target, is a steerable needle. So I haven't told you about steerable needles. How does that work? Well, it's based on the tip design. It's cut like a wedge. So when you push this needle into tissue, it just naturally wants to bend because of that wedge-like tip. And so if you can control both pushing and then spinning the back end of the needle, you can re-aim the tip and get that needle to go wherever you want it to go inside the patient. So how do we test a system like this? Well, we actually put it into a CT scanner, and then we put it inside of a pig lung. And that's what you see on the slide here. And I'm about to show you a video following that robot all the way on its path from uh, outside the uh, lung all the way to the edge of the lung. So this is what it looks like. This is a CT image. And you see, first of all, the bronchoscope coming through here. And then pretty soon you're going to see the concentric tube robot pop out of it, which is right about right there. And then quickly followed by the steerable needle. And the steerable needle gets out to the edge of the lung and we've been able to hit targets with an accuracy of about a millimeter. And to give you an idea of how small that is, the little dot that you see indicating the needle, that's about a millimeter wide. So we're doing really well here. But then we started thinking, well, what's the next step? You know, what else could we do to help doctors with this kind of really cool technology? And we thought, well, we're only giving them one hand. What if we could give them two hands? And so I was talking with Duke Carroll, also a surgeon at Vanderbilt, and we were talking about urologic surgery and doing rigid endoscope, endoscope procedures. And this is what a rigid endoscope looks like. It has a, a straight shaft and then a camera at the tip. And out the, t the end of that endoscope, you actually put a fiber optic laser, which is that blue thing that you see in the picture. And then you use that to cut. So what does this look like when they use it in surgery? It looks something like this. And if you look close, you can see um, down toward the bottom of the image, you can see the laser fiber and it's firing to cut the tissue. And you can see just how hard these procedures are incredibly challenging for the doctors because they have to do everything with one tool. They have to tilt the thing that they're actually using to look at the surgical field 
at the same time as they're aiming the fiber optic laser. And doing these two things at once, not to mention trying to pull the tissue into position for cutting, is very, very difficult. And sometimes they'll get lost and not even know, am I in the right spot? Do I want to cut that or should I be over here? So we built them this, which is a robot that has two hands. So it goes, two of our robots have been pushed through the port in this uh, existing endoscope. One of them aims the laser fiber. The other lets the doctor actually grab the tissue and pull it into position. So what does this look like when used in surgery? This is a model of a prostate, and the doctor's job is to cut out the bottom lobe. And you can see he's doing that here. The really cool thing to notice is the image is not bouncing around at all. So he can maintain a view of the whole surgical field while he's working. The other cool thing to notice is he's got two hands, and he's about to do something he could never hope to do before, which is pick up this chunk of tissue in both hands at once, and then do a slam dunk back into the bladder, right there. <laughs> So he was pretty proud of that one. Uh, and that's a very successful surgical procedure for this. So I've told you now about uh, two different kinds of surgery, lung and prostate. And I want to tell you just about one more example. And this one is really uh, important to me personally because it affected my family. This is my father. And he had a stroke. And the kind of stroke that he had is where a blood vessel in the brain breaks open and just dumps blood into the brain. And that blood can't go anywhere, so it starts compressing the brain tissue, and cells start dying. And so uh, there's, unfortunately, not much doctors can do about this. My dad, when he went into the hospital, he had just a splitting headache, like the worst headache by a factor of 100 that he'd ever had in his life. And they scanned him. They did a CT scan. They knew what he had. They knew he had a hemorrhage. And the only thing they could do for him was put him in a hospital bed and wait and see if he was going to get better. And it turns out that half of the patients that have this die from it. So there my dad is laying in a hospital bed and we don't know if he's gonna live or die. And so there's, we thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something that we could do. And so my students and I, a couple years ago, thought, well, what if we could go into the brain through a needle and then deploy one of our tiny elephant trunk robots and actually vacuum out all of that blood so we can release the pressure and let those brain cells live. And so we built a robot to do that. And this is what it looks like. Here it's suctioning out a model of a brain. And we've sort of cut that model in half so you can see what's going inso on inside. And it's actually red jello that it's, it's suctioning out here. That's a good model for uh, a brain hemorrhage. And you can see it got all of it. So you know, we think this has a ton of potential for the future for being able to help patients like my dad who have hemorrhagic strokes. OK, so speaking of the future, people often ask me, well, where is all of this going? You've showed us all these cool robots. Like, what's going to happen in the future? Are these going to replace doctors? That's often the first question that I get. Well, the doctors go away, and the robots take over the operating room. My answer to that is absolutely not, at least not any time very soon at all, probably any time in the lifetimes of everyone in this room. I don't think so. And why is that? Well, think back to my eye exam. There's still an eye doctor. This is my eye doctor. She's still there. And what did all those robots do when I went in for my eye exam? Well, they were just tools to help her do her job better and better and better. And that's what robots in the operating room are going to be, is tools to help doctors do their jobs better. They're not going to replace the doctors. They're just going to give the doctors better capabilities. The other thing I wanted to point out is there's a lot of people involved in each one of these projects that I've shown you. This is a slide showing all of my uh, doctor collaborators, as well as engineers I work with, and probably most importantly, my students and postdocs, who really do a lot of the work. And the great thing about all these people is the engineers on this slide actually go into foreign territory and go into the operating room and watch what's going on there and learn about the environment and see hands-on how surgery gets done. And that's a real challenge for a lot of engineers. It's completely foreign land, equally foreign, for the doctors is coming into my engineering lab where there's all kinds of equipment they've never seen before and learning about what the technology can do. And then all of that sets the stage for these sparks of inspiration and breakthroughs that can happen, like when we marvel at how an elephant's trunk works. And so just to finish the story of my dad, he survived. He made a complete recovery. Uh, he was one of the lucky ones. And my parents actually today are celebrating their 43rd wedding anniversary. And <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate that. And <laughs> they would have missed out on 16 of those if he had died from his brain hemorrhage. 
right? So how should you feel when a doctor says to you that they're gonna use a robot as part of your surgical procedure? You should be thrilled because that's the best tool available to help you. And what it can give you is more years of quality life like my dad had, and most importantly, more moments like this where he was able to hold his grandson for the first time. Thank you very much.